What makes your dad happy? Hugs and kisses from me that I love him. His family, uh, Jesus. Um, well, bowling, I think that would help. What makes your dad sad? Um, if I don't obey him. When I splash all the water around. What is your dad's favorite thing to do? Go to Starbucks. Play pillow fights. If we go like somewhere special like Disneyland or something. How old is your dad? Um, three, five, sixty-eight. <laughs> How tall is your dad? Well, I'll go with like eight foot twelve or something. <laughs> um, twenty inches. What does your dad do for a job? My dad's a police officer. He protects people. He works hard so that way we can get money to buy toys for our birthday. What do you and your dad do together? Sometimes we would have like a date together. We fight and wrestle. Snuggle when it's nighttime. What's your dad really good at? Lego Star Wars. Cooking. Tickling me because he's like so good I can almost throw up. In what ways are your dad and God the same? My dad and God um, love me and they're perfect. God helps um, me make the right choices and daddy helps me make the right choices sometimes too. Because he gives me a warning. How do you know that your dad loves you? He tells me. Is because he's been with me all my days and um, he's never left me. Sometimes he hugs me and kisses me, and sometimes he says it to me. He's um, honest with me. He's, um, well, I can tell that he really loves me. I love you, Daddy. Happy Father's Day. Dads, we're thankful for you today. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today in our sermon time and celebrate that. But some of y'all are probably wondering, what are these red shirts from? Well, we just got back from youth camp and so we decided to all match a little bit. And so uh, that's what this is about. We're gonna sing a few songs we actually sang at camp this week. So if you would stand up on your feet this morning, we're gonna worship together, lift high the name of Jesus together. Oh, I 
nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. We believe nothing can stand. give our God praise today. We believe he's a good God. We believe that he fights for us, that he has, in fact, won the victory through Jesus. Amen. We're going to continue in worship this morning, singing about this God who changes hearts, who changes lives. This week, we had some students who said, you know what? I want to give my life to ministry. Isn't that amazing? We had some kids who said, you know what, there's other plans I could make, but I wanna follow Jesus with my whole life this week. That's amazing, we're gonna just, that's what God does. When we come before him and we say, God, I'm yours, he says, okay, well, let me take over, let me take control, and let me show you how beautiful life can be when you follow after me. And so I'm just encouraged, I'm thankful this week because of what I got to see, and we're just gonna continue worshiping together this morning, honoring God for who he is and what he does, amen. I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise And treasures that fade But never enough And then you came along You put me back together is now satisfied here in your love yeah. oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing nothing is better than you is anybody testify to that today there's nothing better than Jesus. Amen. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Thank you, Lord. Cause the God of the mountain.
today we come before you humbly. We recognize today, God, that you are such a good and holy Father. God, we as fathers fall short. We don't measure up. We're not perfect. God, you are. Today we confess that, that you are so good. And God, we, today we, we confess that we need you. So God, help us to live our lives as a reflection of that, that recognition that we need you. Help us to cry out to you, God. God, today we just worship you. We honor you as being holy, as a God who loves his children, as a God who calls us out of darkness into the light. Help us to be the church that reflects that in this community and around the world, God. We just continue to worship you now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you would stand as we continue to sing this morning. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry. 
of our whole life, God. Great are you, Lord. Jesus, you are so good. You've given salvation, you've given hope in a world that often feels so hopeless. Jesus, you are our hope. You are our strength. You are our peace. You are our joy, our satisfaction. You are all that we need. So today we come before you gladly to celebrate you, Jesus, because you're worthy of all of our praise, God. God, we just want to lift you high in all that we do. Help us not to forget that. We love you. We worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you will, take your Bibles and open them to page 1039. That's the Pew Bibles, that is. Today is Father's Day, and we're still talking about following Jesus together. And one thing is for certain, that, that um, God doesn't intend for us to, to flesh out the Christian faith in, in a vacuum somewhere, that we are to live it out together, that we belong to each other, we are... We are the family of God, we are the body of Christ, and we need each other. And uh, we're going to look at some verses today to help support that. Um, again, Happy Father's Day. One of the greatest days that ever happened in my life is when I became a father. It was amazing. When Bethany came into this world, it was just unbelievable because just about, I want to say, nine months earlier, I became a Christian. I, I don't think, uh, I think I would have been sterile if I hadn't have become a Christian because God didn't want me to have kids. I would have been a bad example for a kid. But I became a Christian and Lori did and we, she became pregnant. And then we had a little baby girl. And man, I look back over my life and being a father to three girls and, and being a dad and being a granddad and having son-in-laws uh, my son-in-law is right here. That's Ben. He's married to my oldest child. They were married on November the 19th, 2005. Back, back in the day when you used to have church weddings. Do y'all remember that? There used to be that day. Now you do it in a barn, right? I'm not knocking a barn. In fact, Lori and I were talking about the other day that we're trying to figure out what are we going to do when we one day retire? We've come up, we're going we're gonna to have a funeral venue and uh, we're going to just do a venue for funerals. And, and she said, what's it going to be? I said, we're going to buy up a bunch of old chicken houses <laughs> and then we're going to tab it, you know, fly in the coop when you fly the coop. So if you can get married in a barn, you ought to be able to be buried in a chicken house. It seems like that should be where it begins. But 
But back in the day when they were married, I remember, I can remember like it was this morning, the emotion. I remember the letter she gave me and put it in my hand and said, don't read this till after the wedding. This is for you, Dad. I've got that letter. I've held on to that letter. And because I, I, it wasn't that I didn't want her to, to, to get married. It was the fact that I didn't want to have to kill Ben. I did not want to have to do it. <laughs> and I felt like the only way to keep my daughter was to kill Ben, right? <laughs> it wasn't that I didn't love Ben. I just loved Bethany so much more. <laughs> and then in that letter... She wrote all these wonderful things down and she said, you've always asked me, what is it about Ben that I want to spend the rest of my life with? And she, in that little two lines of that letter that has stuck with me all the days of my life, I hope, she said, I would not be marrying Ben today if it were not for the fact that Ben reminds me so much of you. And I thought, wow, because, you know, girls usually grow up and they marry guys that remind them of their dad. And I saw that and I remember that. And to this very day, all these years later, I cherish that. But that wouldn't happen without being a dad, a father. I realized that not every, every man is a father. Not every father is a man. But I do know this is Father's Day. This is the day that we acknowledge that every one of us have benefited from men in our life. Whether it be men at church or whether it be men at work or whether it be men in the marketplace or men at the ball field. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about guys that can spit over the fence. I'm talking about guys that, that live with integrity and purpose and desire. And they want to do the right thing because the right thing is the right thing. You know, it, it, that is what I cherish about godly men. And I've been impacted by that throughout my lifetime. Men who have been consistent in loving God in season and out of season. When, it's, when, it's, when it is convenient and when it's not convenient. When it's contentious. I've seen men love God when everybody hates them. And I marvel at that. I've seen men who have messed up everything they, they have touched in their life until they became a Christ follower. And when they became a Christ follower, they tried to make amends to no avail, but yet they still were Christ followers. They followed after Jesus. You know, that is something that we cherish. And that is something worth being mindful of. The Bible says that they preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, re rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Micah says, he has told you, oh man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? This is it. But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what God desires. That's what he desires, oh man. This is what he wants. Do what is good. He says, do justice, do love, do kindness, and do walk humbly before God. Walk humbly before your God. That's what the Lord desires of every man. Father or no father, every man can do that. God desires that of every man. So beginning in verse number 21 of Ephesians 5, all the way down to verse 4 of chapter 6. I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to read these verses to you. And I will tell you from the very get-go, this is not an exegetical sermon on this mass of text. I'm gleaming from it about men today. I'm not talking about that problem that some women misinterpret and some men misinterpret about Wives submit unto your husbands. Right? I, I, I think that is a place and there is a time to speak of that. And, 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 and clear up a lot of the muddy water that comes with that. 
But what, what I want you to notice is what God requires of men. This is what he says. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands. That's to the Lord because the husband is the head of the wife. As Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. To make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle in anything like it, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Since we are members of his body, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum it up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husbands. Verse 1, chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So that you may, so, so it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in this land. Fathers, do not stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, I love the way the King James puts that verse out there. It says that it encourages us that we would not go through this life and cause our own children, by the way we live our life, To do contrary to the things of God. That we are not to be a stumbling block, but a stepping stone. You know, we men, we, especially men, we carry with ourselves a place of authority. And sometimes we can take that authority and we can use it in the wrong way. So today, may God help us. To see how it is that we are to love God. All right. You may be seated. A couple of things I want to give to you today and, and about dads. And one of them is dads should love like Jesus. I mean, that sounds so easy, doesn't it? It's bumper sticker material. You know, you can throw that out there in just five short words. And man, dads should love like Jesus. You know, like real men love Jesus, you know, or you see those bumper stickers, you know, all those things about loving and and real men. But what is it about loving Jesus that that should be something more than verbiage? Well, we're going to see that for a little bit today. In fact, in verse 25, he says, husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. I mean, that's real love, isn't it? I mean, real men, truly dads who really love like Jesus, first of all, have got to know what it means to love Jesus. You can't love like somebody if you don't know how to love like him. And you've got to know him to love him. I'm completely convinced that the problem, the major problem facing America today, facing globally the church today, is when men do not love like Jesus because they don't know how Jesus loves. The tragedy of tragedies is that there are a lot of people that go through this life today as men and say they love Jesus, but the truth of the matter is they really are impressed with him or maybe they really respect him, but they really don't know him. Or if they do know him, they don't know much about him. And can I tell you that to, to love like Jesus is to do just that, to love Jesus. That's what the writer uh, tells us in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord our God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Listen, loving God always results in loving others. 
Because if we get the vertical part of our love right in, in, with God, then it's going to be a natural thing to love those that are around us. Especially those that are the closest to us. And that is our family. You know, for almost 40 years of, 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 of pastoring or being a Christian, I've heard this over and over again. I can witness to anybody but my family. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever said that? Boy, I can talk to anybody about God, but I can't talk to my family about God. And sometimes, oftentimes, what happens is, is that our family sees us. They have the front row seat of our life. They watch us. They see the conduct, the converse, hear the conversations of our life. So what does that tell us? That if we're going to love God and we're going to love our family like we should and love Jesus like we ought, then we're going to be at a heightened sense of awareness when it comes to the way we conduct our affairs. To love like Jesus is to love Jesus. Many of you have read Chapman's book on the five love languages, and he lists five of those love languages, and every one of those love languages are not just something that can be horizontal in our life, but before they can ever be horizontal, they've got to be vertical. And God is the aggressor in our relationship with him. It wasn't that I woke up and started running toward him. No, he came to me and put the yearning in my heart, put the openness and the brokenness that I needed in my life. Why? So that I could turn to him. I couldn't figure out how to fix the mess that was in my life. Only God could get the credit for that, right? And that's what Chapman does in these love languages. He paints a picture of how we should love one another, but he paints that picture in how we should love God and be loved by God. It's vertical before it's ever horizontal, right? A friend of mine passed away a week or so ago, and I found out about it this week. I hadn't seen her in over 40 years. I'm using friend very loosely. She was a family friend. Our worlds went in different directions. When I found out she had passed away down in Wiggins, Mississippi, I, I started trying to find her siblings. And, 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 and lo and behold, I found only one of them. And I called him up on the phone. He has, a, he has a business. And I called him up on the business phone. And he answered the phone. And I said, is, uh, and I called him by name. And he said, yeah, this is he. And I said, he said, who is this? And I said, this is Billy Abrams. Billy Abrams. How long has it been? 40 years? 40 years. He said, Billy Abrams, I want you to know, I tell everybody I know about Billy Abrams. I said, how's that? He said, actually, we have Facebook. And I read about your life. And I marvel at what God has done in your life. I wish God would have done the same thing in my life. And I think, man. What an unbelievable opportunity every day of our life to follow after Jesus and love him so much that people pick up on the fact that we love him. Even if they have to read about it. We love him. To love like Jesus is to love Jesus. And Gary Chapman unpacks these whole images of what it means to, 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 to have a love relationship with God the Father. He says, it begins with these five love languages. One is the words of affirmation. Can I tell you, dads, you can't say enough how much you love your children or how much you love your grandchildren. But you can be guilty of just saying it and not doing it. See, the words of affirmation, we need affirmation in our life. We need somebody to step into our path and remind us that we are important. And Chapman talks about these, this, these words of, 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 of affirmation. And he, and he gives us several different illustrations, the Bible does, of words of affirmation. Words like this. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who comforts us in all of our comfort. That's an affirmation. If you're struggling, 
You don't have to struggle alone. God is a God of comfort. He affirms that in our life. He affirms that by sending people into our life, by sending his presence into our life, by walking with us in the darkness of our life. Then there's those that, that he reminds us in, in verse number 5 of 2 Corinthians 3. He says, now that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. My friend, that is affirmation. I am sufficient in Christ. I am deficient without him. My life is not complete until he makes it complete. That's affirmation. You find that over and over in the Word of God. In verse, the middle part of the 23rd Psalm. Uh, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. <laughs> affirmation. I will not abandon you. I will walk with you through the darkest times. That's affirmation. So yet... Chapman says there is the words of affirmation. And then he says there's another love language. It's called quality time. I mean, we like that, don't we? We like time, spending time with each other, giving person or someone the attention, giving them the full attention. Can I tell you that, that quality time with God it's not as much as the how much time, it's how much is the quality of that time. Does God have our undivided attention? Now I know I'm here. I know how it is. I'm standing here, so I'm looking here. So I know how it is. It's hard to keep anybody's attention. That's why TikTok is such a phenomenon. It's because everybody just gets these little pockets of things. Can I tell you what God wants for your life and my life? It's every day of our life, whatever conversation or conduct, God wants to have quality time in our life. And you really cannot spend quality time with God apart from the truth of God. And that's the Word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, O God. That's what we find in the Bible. And that's God teaching us the need of quality time. Chapman said the third gift is that of gifts. God gives gifts. His name, Jehovah Jireh, means that he provides for our life. James 1, 17 says that every generous act and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with him, there is no variation or shadow or cast by turning. In other words, God is a gift-giving God. And we gift God back. We re-gift him. God gives, we receive, we in turn re-gift back to God. God wants us to be like that. That every day is a gift, so give it to God. Every child is a gift, so give it to God. Every opportunity that God gives you to have a relationship is a gift from God, so give it to God. Give it all to God. That's a gift. That's the language of God. Then he says there are acts of service. You know, Colossians says, whatever you do, do it enthusiastically. It's some, something done for the Lord and not for men. There are acts of service. There are things that we just do. There are things that we are called to do. There are responsibilities in every one of our lives, caring for those who cannot care for themselves. I was reminded this morning that next Saturday we go to the VA in Pale City. It's our church going to the VA. It's not three or four people's responsibility. It's the church's responsibility to care for those that are shut in and oftentimes overlooked. You know, how awesome would it be that if we found, whether it's the VA or something or someone that we could pour our life into, pour our life into acts of service serving God serving others meeting the needs of others meeting the needs of others who are hurting or helpless or need God does things in our life God works in our life 
and he works through our life. The fifth one is physical touch. Man, when the Bible says he touched me, he touched me. That's not some kind of pie in the sky mentality. The presence of God touches us at different places and different times of our life. I mean, that is the touch of God. That is more than even a physical touch. But think about this. The physical touches of our life. Years ago, there was a lady who came to our church. She's in heaven today, but she used to come to our church. And she was, she was aged. It was hard. It was difficult. She'd get out. She'd make her way in. And one day, I just had to ask her, I said, why is it that you go through all of this struggle to get here every Sunday? She said, because this is the only day of the week I get touched. I don't get touched by nobody during the week. I don't have nobody home with me. I don't have nobody coming over and wanting to hug me. But I am guaranteed that if I come here, somebody's going to come to me. And they're going to put their arm around me. And they're going to tell me that I'm something to them. Can I tell you how awesome would it be that it's every day of our life that we just give God a big old hug and say, God, I love you. I love you so much. I can't stand the thought of you not loving me and holding me. God, I'm thankful that you touch me in places that I've never been touched before for reasons, God, only you could get the credit for. See, God calls us to that end. Second thing I want you to know is that, that your family, we need to love like Jesus. So therefore, we find out how Jesus loves. But get this, folks. Your family needs your love, especially dads. Your family needs your love. You need to be the one oftentimes reminding them. Just as he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for Listen to, listen to what he says. Husband, this is how we do it. We love our wife. How do we love our wife? Just the way Jesus loved the church. How did he love his church? He gave himself for it. What does that mean? He was selfish. No, he was selfless. We have no right to be selfish when Jesus was selfless. If we're going to love like Jesus, we've got to be selfless, not selfish. We love. He was sacrificial. Isn't that the beauty of the Christian life? It's that sacrificial life. Sacrificially loving others. Doing that very selfish, selflessly loving others. Not putting ourselves at the top, but at the bottom. Learning what that means to love others in a way that would please God. The Bible says in verse 28, so all men to love their wives as their own bodies. I don't know a man yet that when he's not hungry, he won't feed himself. I mean, when he, even when he's not hungry, he will feed himself. I don't know a man yet that doesn't have enough wherewithal within himself to, 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 to take a bath every other day if he needs it. He'll clean himself. We are self-cleaning people. We're like those dogs in my backyard. We're self-cleaners, guys. You know? This is what he says. He said, this is who we are. Men ought to love their wives, love their families. Demonstrate love. Why? Because you care about yourself. Why should you not care about others? Others are more important than you. Put others first. We should love others. The last thing before we go to Taco Bell. <laughs> your family, they need your leadership. There's a thousand, thousand voices every day that in our kids' ears, grown kids' ears, our grandkids' ears, they're telling us what, 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 telling them what to believe, what to say, what to affirm. Every day, 
bombarded with all of these things that are out there. And yet the Bible says, fathers, don't stir up anger in your children. In other words, he says, make clear that you do not provoke your children to wrath. Hey, dads, guess what we can do? We can provoke our children to wrath. That's unbelievable. That Paul said, don't do this because you can do this, but don't do this. Don't do it. Don't be the very person that, that, that stands in the way of, 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 of being a stumbling block to a child or to a grandchild or to somebody that looks up to you. Don't be that person. He tells us right there. He says, fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in their training. And, and, and King James it says, in the nurture. And then it says, in the instruction of the Lord. King James says, in the admonition of the Lord. In other words, as children, as people of God, as men of God, God has called us to do the the, the best thing we can do with our life, and that is equip those that, are, that we have leadership over and be equippers. Not, not, not people that are going to stir up anger, but to equip them and bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And listen, there are a lot of things that we do as dads that's good. We, it's good to promote education. Should do that. It's good to, to help them financially get on their feet. We should do that. It's good that if you outlive your wealth, to leave it to your family. It's good that you leave something behind. All those things are good. But I'm going to tell you, you will become one colossal dud if that's all you do. If that's it. If that's all you do, dads. Listen, you provide them them place to, to, to use the bathroom. You bought the tissue. You bought the sheets they slept in. The car they drove, and you did all that, and you think, oh, I did it. I am the best dad in the world because my kid wouldn't have nothing if it wasn't for my hard labor. I'm going to tell you something, friend. And dads, listen here. If all you do is give your kids a place to sleep, pay for an education to get, or get, put some money in their pocket and you don't give them nothing more than that, then you will fail them. You will fail them. Because the absolute most important thing that we can ever do for our children is to point them and train them in the instruction of God. And to do that, we've got to be being instructed at the same time. Because we never age out of this thing. We never get to a point that we could just hit the dad pause button and say, hey, I, I don't have to be a dad now. I don't, my kids are grown. My grandkids are grown. The great grandkids won't remember. So I'm pausing out. I'm tapping out. I'm just going to live for the flesh. Don't ever think that guys don't do that. Don't you ever think for one life to, moment in life that, that, that guys, there are not tons of guys that have just tapped out to this world. And just don't do anything. See, that's a tragedy, isn't it? You know, it's been, oh my gosh, I don't know, um, 35 years since my father passed away, I went to his grave as the sun was setting in New Hope, Mississippi last night. It was going down over New Hope and I pulled up there. I'd already left. I'd been doing some work at my mom's place. And, and I'd already left, pointed back towards Birmingham. And I said, I need to go at least go to the grave. I turned around and went back to where mom and dad's buried there at Mount Zion in New Hope. And. The sun was coming down and I just stood there and I looked at that grave and, and I just folded up my arms and I thought to myself, man, dad, you sure would have loved them kids of mine. You sure would have loved them grandkids too. Dad, you would, it would have been awesome. 
But just like it was in my dad's life, like it is in so many dads' life, there were things that mattered most to dad. And it was his addiction to alcohol. And there, as he was dying in that hospital in July of 27th of 1987 in Columbus, Mississippi, and I spent all those nights with him waiting for death to come. One night, in the darkness of the night, just me beside his bed, he reached his old gout swollen hand over that bed and he said, son, come here. I held onto that hand. He looked me in the face. He said, I wish I had not have done this to y'all. I wish I'd have done differently. I wish I'd have committed my life to God and not wasted it. Can you forever forgive me, son? I was already a Christian at that time. I said, Daddy, you are forgiven. And then a few days later, he was gone. I'm telling you, a few days later, and every man in here is going to be gone. Every one of us is going to be gone. And what we leave behind is what we've lived. If you want to leave a legacy, live a legacy. Live it. Live it. Live it every day of your life. When it's easy, when it's not so easy, live it. When things are hard and they're real hard and sometimes they get harder than hard, confess it. Look them in the face and apologize to them when you've done wrong by them. Nothing wrong with that. More importantly, look into the face of a God that loves you unconditionally and wants nothing but the best for you. Because I'm going to tell you, it's been 35 years that I've been without a physical, earthly father, but I hadn't missed a beat. Because I have a heavenly father. And I'm going to tell you, a heavenly father is the most important father you could ever have in your life. Because you can make it without a biological dad. But you cannot make it without God. You just can't. You can exist, but you can't live without God. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for reminding us this morning in this place, God, how much we need you. Lord, this is just not a God message. Lord, this is for all of us today. Father, we need to know what it means to, to, to love you and to love like you. Father, we, we need to, to, to embrace that with our life today. Father, we all should love like Jesus. And to love like Jesus, it means to be loved by Jesus. So whether it's someone today that needs to turn their heart to you and say, yes, today, Jesus, I want you to know that I am a colossal sinner. I have sinned willingly. I have chosen sin as a pattern often in my life. So I confess to you I'm a sinner. And I agree with you that I'm a sinner. And I beg you to forgive me of my sin. And I want to live my life to please you. May this be that day that you just confess to him the very thing that you long for. And that's for a father to step into your world. And to love you unconditionally. Love you in your sin, but love you so much that he will help you out of that. Would you trust Jesus today? Would you? For those of you today that are just, uh, your heart is heavy. You've got loved ones. You've got children and grandchildren. And, and you know that this, 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 
this battle, this war that's going on around you is more than you can take. But today, be encouraged. It's not more than God can take. Don't give up in this battle. Keep loving Jesus. Keep loving those who don't seem to love Jesus around you. Keep following him. As we stand to our feet, this invitation is for you today to do what God would lead you to do. just worship you and we put our trust in who you are. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground. He's my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. Oh, I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to
setting, same old praise. 